Today, inshallah, we are starting from page 58, preparation for the other prayers. Bismillah. Preparation for the other prayers. You should get ready for the Zohar prayer before midday. Therefore, you may take the siesta before this time, if you stay up at night for the night vigil prayer, or remain awake for some other good purpose. So, Imam Ghazali is saying, before Zawal, before midday, we should take out some time and take the siesta nap. In Arabic, we call it Qaylula, a midday nap. And the ideal time for the midday nap is before Dhuhr time. So that's why, that's why when you wake up for Dhuhr Salah, then after that you're awake all the way till night when you're ready to go to sleep. Sleeping after Dhuhr Salah is not a good idea because you're putting yourself back to sleep and the Salah time after that is very close. The best time to take that midday nap is before Dhuhr Salah. At the time, you know, midday time, there's not really much happening. You're not, you're not supposed to pray any Salah during that time anyway. So you take a rest then, and then after that you wake up at Dhuhr Salah and stay awake all the way till the end. Here Imam Ghazali, he puts a caveat there though. He says that, فَتُقَدِّمَ الْقَيْلُولَةَ إِنْ كَانَ لَكَ قِيَامٌ بِاللَّيْلِ That only do Qaylula Salah if you intend to wake up for Tahajjud Salah. If you don't intend to wake up for Tahajjud Salah, then Imam Ghazali says, then don't do Qaylula. The reason is because he says, you're already sleeping so much and you want to sleep more. Then he gives an example, he says, it's like the one who eats suhoor but doesn't fast. You're going to eat through the day, so now you're waking up in the morning and having another meal. So he said, in that case, it's better for you to cut your sleeping off and spend that time awake because you're going to sleep through the night anyway. Yes? This nap has the benefit of helping one stay up at night as the pre-dawn meal helps one in fasting during the day. Taking a nap during the day without praying at night is like having a pre-dawn meal without fasting during the day. So here Imam Ghazali, he gives a very interesting point here. He says that having this nap will help you wake up at night. So for those of us that are struggling to wake up for Tahajjud Salah, and we want to make this a part of our regular habit, then one of the easy ways is to take a nap during the day. Or if you're struggling to wake up for, wake up for Fajr Salah and it's not happening, you're trying a lot, then take a nap during the day. You take a nap during the day, and obviously sleep on time during, at, the, at night time, inshallah you'll easily be able to wake up for Fajr Salah and Tahajjud Salah. Yes? Make an effort to wake up from the nap before midday. Perform ablution and go to the mosque and perform the greeting prayer. Wait for the muazzin and respond to him. So here Imam Ghazali is suggesting that sleep, wake up at Zawal, Zawal is midday, wake up at midday, and go to the masjid in the state of wudu before midday. So you're now, you're not getting to the masjid at the time of Dhuhr, you're getting there before Dhuhr. And this is actually a sunnah. So what, what, what aspect of this is a sunnah? Going to prayers and waiting for them. What happens to most of us is that we come for prayer right when it's time for the prayer. Here Imam Ghazali is saying, get to the masjid in advance and sit there. Be early for your meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone who comes early to a meeting is a sign of how eager that person is. You know, if I told you that meet me at 5 o'clock and you come to the meeting point at 4.30, that shows that you're very eager. You don't want to be late at all. You want to be on time. It shows how needy you are for that meeting. So when we're coming to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our salah, coming early is a very good thing. Here Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi says that come to the masjid early. Now another point to note here, he says, when you try to wake up before midday, perform wudu, and then go to the masjid. So when we go to the masjid, should we do wudu at the masjid or should we do wudu at home? This is the question. What's the answer to this? Home. You should do wudu at home, not in the masjid. Ideally, you should always try to do wudu at home. The only reason why we have wudu facilities in the masjid is because in case there's an accident or just for a backup. This masjid, the money that the, that the water, that's used for water in the masjid is waqf money. It's on an, it's on an endowment. Okay? And every penny we waste, every drop we waste is taken away from the waqf money. And we have to answer, waqf is the money that belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're, we're accountable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why I told you guys this earlier, some scholars even say that when you do wudu in the masjid, you won't wash your limbs three times, you only wash, wash them once. Remember I told you guys this? Some scholars, what did they say? That if you're doing wudu in the masjid, then you won't wash your limbs three times. You only wash it once, because that money or that water, you're supposed to save. And if you want to do long wudus, you can do them at home. Ideally, always try to do your wudu at home. Many of us, the reason why we prefer not to do wudu at home, especially in winter in Chicago, is because when I walk out, I'm going to chill. I'm going to freeze. 
then do a little a little earlier. You know, maybe you can you know dry yourself appropriately, but always try to do your wudu at home. That's the that's the appropriate manner. And then after doing wudu, Imam Ghazali says, now go to the masjid and pray the two rakat of greed in the masjid. We already talked about the two rakat of greed in the masjid last week. May Allah subhanahu wa taala give us all the tawfiq to be punctual on these two rakat. Qulu amin. Okay, next. Then get up and pray four rakat after the sun moves from its zenith. So. Wait for the adhan, give response to the adhan, and then now stand up and pray four rakat. These four rakat are the four rakat sunnah we pray before dhuhr salah. These are sunnah al-mu'akkada. These are emphasized sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam regularly prayed these four rakat throughout the day. There are how many sunnahs that are emphasized by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in prayer? Anyone know? Twelve. Twelve. Yes, twelve is the correct answer. One says fourteen. One says twelve. Okay. The answer is twelve. What are the twelve? Anyone know? Two in the morning. Two rakat before Fajr Salah. Okay, you guys have to count. Four rakat before Dhuhr Salah. How many is that? Six done. Two rakat after Dhuhr Salah. How many is that? Eight. Eight. Two rakat after Maghrib. That's ten. ten. And then two rakat after Isha is twelve. These are twelve sunnahs that we must be punctual on praying every single day. We must be punctual in particular not to miss these 12, 12 sunnahs. So the first one here is four rakat before Dhuhr Salah itself. Here Imam Ghazali Alhamdulillah quotes that. And now he quotes a very beautiful hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Go ahead. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will lengthen them and say, This is the time when the doors of heaven are open. And I would like good works to be raised up and from me during it. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that this is the time when the doors of Jannah are opened up. And I want to, he would make these four rakat long. The reason was because he said that I want my good deeds to be lifted into the sky when the doors are open. So this is like, a, you know, at that time, this is my present to, to Jannah. I'm sending my, my salah immediately to Jannah as the doors open up. Yes. These four rakats before Zahar are emphasized sunnah. The sunnah the mu'akkada, emphasized sunnah. For it states in the narration that whoever performs them, bowing and prostrating in the most excellent manner, will have 70,000 angels pray with him and ask forgiveness for him until the night. So 70,000 angels will make istighfar for him and make dua for him until night. If you pray, which rakats? Four rakat before Dhuhr Salah. But the hadith, the, the hadith has two points. Ahsana ruku'ahunna wa sujudahunna. Do the ruku' and sujood properly. Which means take your time, relax, pray it easy. Don't be in a rush. So Imam Ghazali is saying, come early, pray these properly, and you're already set. You have all this reward piled up just from here. Yes. Then perform the obligatory prayers with the Imam. Follow pray them with the Imam meaning in Jama'at. So don't miss the Dhuhr Salah in Jama'at. In winter, many of us tend to miss Dhuhr Salah with Jama'at. And the reason is because many people are at work or they're caught between classes. But if you have your own job, you have your own work, you live close to a masjid, you're on the road, then try to make it such that you can make it to the masjid for your Dhuhr Salah. Try your best. If you can't, then that's understandable during the weekdays. At least in the weekends, make yourself make a point that I'm going to try to pray my Dhuhr Salah, all of my Salats, but at least my Dhuhr Salah in the, in the masjid. Yes. Following this prayer, perform two rakats, for they are from the stand of the established sunnah. Like I said, after the four rakat before Dhuhr, and then two rakat after Dhuhr. These are the sunnah al-mu'akkada, yes. Then until the other prayer, do not occupy yourself with anything other than learning useful knowledge. Helping a Muslim, reciting the Qur'an, or striving to earn your living by which you support your religious life. Now here Imam Ghazali says, after Dhuhr salah is over, until Asr, what do you do? Imam Ghazali says again, try to seek knowledge if you can. What are the ways of seeking knowledge? Either you can go to a teacher and seek knowledge, or you can review on your own. Notice I didn't say review with the teacher and study on your own. I said study with the teacher or review on your own. So you can go and study with the teacher, and if there's no teacher to study with, then whatever you have memorized or whatever you have learned, you can review with your own, what we call mutala. Or i'ana to Muslim, go and help a Muslim. You know someone's in need, this is a good time to go and help people. And the Prophet wasallam says in a very beautiful tradition, this is a very powerful hadith, memorize this hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah fi aun al abd ma dam al abd fi aun akhi. The translation memorize it. Allah will assist the servant as long as he is assisting his brother. What does the hadith say? Allah will help you as long as you are helping your brother. As long as you're helping someone, Allah's help will be with you. You stop helping other people, you may think you're doing yourself a favor and they've lost out, but in reality they haven't lost out. You've lost out because the moment you stop helping people, people that's when you stop helping yourself because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's assistance, assistance goes from you. Qira'at al-Qur'an, read the Qur'an. And then Imam Ghazali says, أَوْ سَعِيٍ فِي مَعَاشٍ تَسْتَعِينُ بِهَا عَلَى دِينِكَ Or go and earn money. Go and earn money. Go and earn. Why should you go and earn? Because if you earn money, then you will have 
the, the ability to support yourself and your religion. You can fulfill your zakat, fulfill your hajj, you can you know, build masajid, there's so many good things that you can do, prevent yourself from haram. So go and earn. Now, in the, at the, in the Arabian lands, the, most, the, the two times in which the markets would boom, basically it would be prime time to buy and sell, was after Fajr Salah and around Asr Salah time. You guys understand that? Because the rest of the morning, what was the problem? It was too hot. No one can go. You know, today when we go for Hajj and Umrah, you ask the brothers, right? You ask the brothers that go for Hajj and Umrah, if you need to do shopping for your family, when do you go? Now everyone goes at night time because their market's open and lights are there. But imagine a, a Makkah and Medina without lights and without big supermarkets and malls. When would be the times to go shopping? Either after Fajr or around Asr time. And Asr Salah time was when the markets would be booming. This because the sun would be cutting down, getting closer to the evening, everyone's getting whatever they need for the night. And that's when the markets would be booming. And that was a time where people at times were a little negligent for Salah. That's why the Prophet said Allah, that's why Allah says in the Quran, حَافِذُوا عَلَى الصَّلَوَاتِ وَالصَّلَاةِ الْوُسْطَى That be punctual with your prayers and the middle prayer. Which one's the middle prayer? Out of the five, which is the middle? Asr Salah. Many scholars say that that's referring to Asr Salah. Why did Allah say, be punctual in all and Asr well, as well? Like you know, He said Asr is inclusive in the five, but then He mentions Asr again. The reason is because Asr Salah is one that people commonly miss. And I feel that we haven't gone far from that. Even in our communities, Asr Salah is usually the one people easily miss. And Dhuhr Salah as well, because in our times, markets are running during Dhuhr time as well. So Dhuhr and Asr, usually people miss their, their Salah because they're studying or they're buying and selling, and that's how they miss them. We should be particular not to miss our Salah, especially the Asr Salah here. Yes. Before Asr, pray four rakahs which are emphasized sunnahs. The Prophet said, May Allah have mercy on the slave who prays four rakahs before Asr. Abu Dawood. Make an effort to be a beneficiary of the Prophet's supplication. Now the Prophet said, Whoever prays four rakahs before Asr, may Allah have mercy on him. Now how do you gain the dua of the Prophet Pray the four. You pray the four, you got the dua of the Prophet That's quite beautiful, right? The Prophet made a dua. It's not my dua or someone else's dua. Whose dua is this? The Prophet ﷺ. The best way to get that dua is pray the four rakat before Asr, and you're now a beneficiary of that dua. Yes. Make an effort to be a beneficiary of the Prophet ﷺ's supplication. After Asr, do not engage in anything except the same as what was mentioned earlier. Your time should not be without any structure. Your time should not be without any structure. You should have structure. And again, Imam Ghazali said, don't waste your time after Asr Salah. Now a lot of people, what they do is they come home after Asr Salah and they go to sleep. The scholars say that sleeping after Asr Salah is disliked. One of the reasons why they say sleeping after Asr Salah is disliked, and similarly after Maghrib Salah, they say sleeping is also disliked. The reason is because you'll end up missing the next prayer. If you sleep after Asr Salah, usually the, Asr, the time between Asr and Maghrib is very short. And especially if you follow the Hanafi school of thought, it's 45 minutes shorter than the Shafi'i school of thought. So you may have just about an hour, hour, 15 minutes. Now if you go to sleep, you may end up missing your Maghrib Salah, and the chances are very high. And people when they sleep during the day, you end up usually falling into a deep sleep because you're so tired and the heat and stuff. Now if you're in the deep sleep, someone tries to wake you up, the chances are you may not wake up and you'll end up missing the salah. And this is very common. It's not something that's, you know, that's just said. People know that this is a dangerous time. The scholars say that there are three things that are a sign of foolishness. The first thing is to laugh without excitement. You know how some people just laugh for the sake of it, ha ha. You know, they laugh just for the sake of it. They're not excited, nothing was, there was nothing funny, they're just laughing for the sake of laughing. They say this is a sign of foolishness. The second is, أَكْلُمْ مِنْ غَيْرِ جُوعٍ To eat without hunger. That's a sign of foolishness. Why are you eating if you're not hungry? Because eating is for hunger. There are some people who will say eat every three hours. That's another thing altogether, right? But otherwise, if you're not hungry, you're not supposed to be eating. For normal human beings, that is. And the third thing, نَوْمُ مِنْ نَهَارٍ مِنْ غَيْرِ سَهْرِ بِاللَّيْلِ and to sleep during the day without spending a portion of the night awake. What's the point sleeping during the day if you're not going to spend a portion of the night uh, awake? So here, again, the reason why I said not to sleep after Asr Salah, because first of all, the Salah time is so short. And the second thing is, why would a person even sleep during the day knowing that I'm not going to wake up for the Hajjud Salah during the night? Yes? Your time should not be without any structure, such that you occupy yourself arbitrarily with whatever comes along. Right. And that's what happens to most of us. We don't have structure, and how do we end up going through the day? We go along with it. Which means whatever happens, I'll let it happen. You know, I get a phone call, I react to that. I do this, I react to that. Whatever happens, you just go with the flow. Imam Ghazali says, no, we don't live the go with the flow of life. We plan everything in advance. 
today morning when you wake up or today I should, you, should be able, you should already know tomorrow how your full day is going to be. And Alhamdulillah, there are people in our community like this, I'm not going to lie. There are certain people in our community, if you tell them, tomorrow can I meet you at 8 p.m., they'll say, I can't do it, it's already committed. Can I meet you at 6 p.m.? I can't do it, it's already committed. And that's very beautiful. You know, it's beautiful that they have their whole day under wrap and if they really need to fit you in, it's going to be used at the end of the day or beginning of the day where they had open gaps. And that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. This is, and our children as well. From a young age, we should train them to have everything set. That this is how I'm going to deal with it. You know, I, this is an interesting point. Just this week, there was a brother who messaged me and he, from, from New York. He said to me, Mufti Saab, I need to speak to you. So I said, okay, you know what, can you text message me what your issue is? So he said the issue is, and he said something very ridiculous. So I said, look brother, why don't you email me your issue, I'll read through it, and then after I read through it, I'll give you a time to speak to you. So he said to me, uh, why are you being so stubborn? Just answer my call. I said, I can't answer your call. I have 10 people in front of me, I have classes, I have a family, I have work, I have so many things to do. I can't just answer your call. If you email me your issue, then I can answer your call. He said, I'm not going to email you. I said, that's your choice, I can't, then I can't answer your call. He said, stop being stubborn and answer the call. So he's calling me off the hook. So I said, look brother, there is a matter of tartib. This is a way we deal with people that if you have an issue, you submit. And the reason isn't because I'm being stubborn, is because if someone sends an issue, they say, Mufti Sahib, I need to speak to you for five minutes. And the issue actually requires one hour. Now I can't deal with that in five minutes. I need to set aside one hour. And sometimes the issues are such that you need to think about them. Some of the issues are such that you can't just answer on the spot. You need to think about it. Okay, what's the situation here? What do we need to consider right now? How do we factor this in? You know, the other day someone asked a question that there is a, I think it was a guy who was a Muslim, the girl was Hindu, and they wanted to do the marriage, and, um, and, and, and they said that we'll do, the, we'll do the marriage in the masjid, and then after that we want to do the marriage again in the Hindu temple. So how do we deal with the situation? So the fiqh of it is very clear. Obviously the marriage is invalid and the, you shouldn't do all this stuff. But the question here isn't about the fiqh, now it's about they've already made their mind up how do you deal with the situation, how do you salvage the situation, you understand what I'm saying? And that's where you need to think about it, you need to call the scholars and say the situation's already broken, but how do you salvage this now, how do you deal with what's, what's left? So the point came where I said to this brother, look, I explained to him that look, you need to explain so I, I can think about it, set it on. And then at the end of it, this brother used such foul language, I don't think anyone has ever called me that particular word since I've graduated. I think anyone in my life has ever called me that word. And I said to that brother that you're lucky you're in New York. <laughs> if you were in Chicago, this wouldn't have ended just by closing my phone down. I mean, I don't want to sound threatening or anything, that's not my point. The point that I'm making is that there should be a tartib. Every single person should have a tartib in their life that I have this schedule and I can only allocate this many hours to sleep, I can only allocate this many hours to food because the rest of the day is busy. And this is what Imam Ghazali is actually, what he's suggesting. You read that again? Your time should not be without any structure, such that you occupy yourself arbitrarily with whatever comes along. Rather, you must take account of yourself and order your worship during the day and the night, assigning to each period of time an activity that must not be neglected, nor replaced by another activity. So Imam Ghazali says, when you give yourself a time to do something, if you say, for example, I'm going to go for a run at 7 a.m. in the morning. So Imam Ghazali says, don't miss it and don't replace it. Does that make sense to you? First thing, what did he say? Don't miss it. If you made your mind up you're going to do something, then always do that thing on time. And the second thing he said, and this is where most of us get caught, sometimes we don't miss it but we end up replacing it. We say, oh, you know what, today I'll do it here and then tomorrow I'll do this in the evening. We kind of swap things around. Imam Ghazali says, no, no, no. If you've given yourself a time for something, then make sure you're consistent with that. Don't miss it or don't even replace it. Because you may think you'll do it later on in the day, but replacing it is a first step of inconsistency. Two days later you're going to stop doing it altogether. So don't miss it or don't replace it. Yes? By this ordering of time, the blessing in time will show itself. A person who leaves himself without a plan, as animals do, not knowing what he is to do at any given moment, will spend most of his time fruitlessly. Your time is your life, and your life is your capital. By it you make your trade, and by it you will reach the eternal bounties in the proximity of Allah. Every single breath of yours is a priceless jewel, because it is irreplaceable. Once it is gone, there is no return for it. So do not be like fools who rejoice each day as their wealth increases while their lives decrease. What good is there in wealth that increases while one's lifespan decreases? Allahu Akbar. You know, these are points where Imam Ghazali, he just lays down the reality of life in front of us. That as every breath goes, as every year goes, as every day goes, it's gone. You can't gain that back again. So, you know, for our young brothers that are sitting here, remember today you're young. Okay, there are so many things you can do. 
don't waste these hours or days, don't waste them, because once they're gone, you can't retrieve them again. They're gone, that's just the reality of life. It's, once it slips away, that time is gone. So Imam Ghazali is saying that don't let that be the case. And then he highlights the, the, the reality of how people waste most of their time running after the money while their life is decreasing. Running after the money while their life is decreasing. And they have no preparation for the hereafter. So create a balance. You know, go Earn some money, but also earn your akhirah as well along the line. Yes? Do not rejoice except in an increase of knowledge or an increase of good works. Truly, the People rejoice in an increase of money. Yes or no? When there's a pay raise, what do they do? Take the friends out for lunch. Take them out for dinner. Take them somewhere. But an increase in knowledge, does anything happen? Yes or no? If you ever increase in knowledge, do people hold like, you know, if someone like, you know, today I finished one juz, let's have a dinner. No one does that. Or today, alhamdulillah, I pray the hajjud salah, everyone let's go and celebrate this moment or enjoy our happiness. No one does that. So we don't, we're not excited over our deeds or our knowledge. We get excited over wealth. When the reality is that we shouldn't be excited over wealth. In reality, what we should be happy over is our deeds and our knowledge. These things increase, it should cause happiness. Yes. Truly, they are your two friends who will accompany you in accompany you in your grave. What are the two friends that he's talking about here? Knowledge, knowledge and action. He's saying these are your two friends that will accompany you in your grave as well. Your spouse, your wealth, your children, and your friends will remain behind. Everything else is going to be left behind. Everything you invested every second in, when it comes time for your body to be lowered down into the grave, it's all going to be left behind. The only thing that will enter that grave with you, when it's sealed off, your actions and your knowledge. These are two things that are going to walk with you. Everything else, it's all going to be left right behind. Yes. Then when the sun turns red, make your effort to return to the mosque. So now we just, we're at Asr time, Imam Ghazali is giving advice. Now Asr time is closing and we're closing, moving close to Maghrib time, okay? What to do now? When the sun turns red, yes? Make your effort to return to the mosque before the sunset and occupy yourself in glorifying Allah and seeking forgiveness. The special merit of this time is comparable to the special merit of the time before the sunrise. I had seen this in England abundantly and also when I had visited India and Pakistan that before Maghrib Salat time people make it a point to come early and make dua. I had seen this a lot. Before Maghrib Salat people come in every single day and especially I had seen that people are very particular to make dua before Maghrib on which day? On Friday. Have you guys noticed that before? You go back home, before Asr Salah, before Maghrib Salah on Friday, the masjid is almost packed because everyone knows that's the time in which dua is accepted. When I was a student in Madrasa, I remember this so clearly. Every student in the Madrasa knew that if they wanted their Quran to finish, if they wanted their Quran to be solid and firm, the one time you never missed dua was before Maghrib Salah. That was one time where all the students would be lined up sitting in the masjid making their dua, making their dua because that's the time where dua is accepted. So don't waste this time, sit down and make dua during this time. Ideally at the hajjid time as well. But if you're going to miss one, that's not the justification to miss the other. At least one you should catch. And that's before Maghrib for sure. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ قَبْلَ تُلُوعِ الشَّمْسِ وَقَبْلَ غُرُوبِهَا And glorify your Lord with His praise before the rising of the sun and before the setting of the sun. Yes. Before sunset, recite was shamsi wa duha surat al shams and wa laini ida yaksha al layl and the two chapters of protection al falak and al nas. The sun should set while you are begging for forgiveness. That's how the sun should set. When the adhan is being called, everyone should already be in dua. You should have to stop your dua for the sake of the adhan. Otherwise, the adhan shouldn't be called for maghrib in particular while you're not in dua. Yes. When you hear the call to prayer, repeat after it. Then pray. O oh Allah, I ask of you at the approach of your night and the retreat of your day, at the advent of your prayer and the voices engaged in, call, in calling on you to grant Muhammad a place near you, as mentioned previously. After responding to the call to commence, perform the obligatory prayer. Following mature rakat before speaking, these are, the two sun, these are the sunnah prayers of Maghrib. If you perform after them a further four, lengthening them a little, that is also a sunnah. So after, after Maghrib Salah, we want to pray two rakat, which is sunnah al-mu'akkadah. Remember I told you guys, two rakat before Fajr, four rakat before Dhuhr, two after Dhuhr, two after Maghrib, two after Isha. So two after Maghrib, you want to pray. Imam Ghazali is saying, after praying these two, try to add another four. If you add another four, how many is that all together now? Six. six. The six rakats after Maghrib Salah, what do we call them? Anyone know? Awwabeen. What do we call them? Awwabin, these are very special prayers, very special. So the two rakat of sunnah after maghrib, and then just add another four, and that becomes the six rakat of awwabin. These are very important prayers. Imam Ghazali, he gives, uh, he, gives uh, he, he, he mentions that it's a sunnah, and he gives more explanation up ahead. Yes. 
Possible for you to intend being in retreat in the mosque until Isha, and you enliven this time with prayer, do so, for what has been related of its greatness is beyond measure, and is called the vigil of the night. So the first, the, between Maghrib and Isha is a time where everyone should try to spend in the masjid. That's what an ideal society should look like. An ideal society, what should happen is, between Maghrib and Isha, nobody goes home. Everybody comes to the masjid for Maghrib, they sit there, if the children need to play in the back, they can go outside and play, I mean not after Maghrib, maybe in the, if they have an indoor gym, they can go and play there. Maybe Quran classes can take place, you can have a lecture between Maghrib and Isha. And ideally everyone should stay there until Isha, after Isha Salah, you should head back. Imam Ghazali says, use this time for worship, because this is the vigil of the night. What is the vigil of the night? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He says, تَتَجَافَى جُنُوبُهُمْ عَنِ الْمَضَاجِعِ That the true servants of Allah are those, while Allah praises them, he says their sides part their beds during the night, meaning they get up for prayer. And what are these, what, which part of the night is it referring to? The scholars say the first part of the night. And the first part of the night is the night, the part between Maghrib and Isha. Because night starts at Maghrib, and between Maghrib and Isha, that's also considered the first part of the night. So this is the time in which you want to spend worshipping him. Yes? This is the prayer between the two Ishas, that is Maghrib and Isha. He cleanses one of the nonsense committed during the day and rectifies the end of it. Iraqi from Mustad al -Dailam. Next paragraph. When the time of Isha comes, perform four rakahs before the obligatory prayer to enliven the time between the call to prayer and the call to commence, for its virtue is immense. It states in the narration, supplication between the call to prayer and the call to commence is never rejected. Messiah. Perform the, the obligatory rakahs of Isha, then two sunnah rakahs, reciting in them Surah al-Sajda and Surah al-Mulk, or Yasin and al dukan as this has been related from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So four rakat sunnah, four rakat um, fad, um, fad of Aisha salah, and then two rakat sunnah after that. Yes. Then pray four rakats, since that which indicates its great merit has been mentioned in the narrations. Then perform the witr as three rakats, either with two salams in a set of two followed by a single rakat, or with one salam in a set of three altogether. That's the Hanafi opinion we thought we only do with one salam, pray three Prepare three straight and then one salam at the end. Yes. The Messenger of Allah used to recite in them Surah Al A'la, Al Kafirun, and Al Ikhlas, and the two chapters of protection, Al Falak and Al Nas. If you have resolved to perform the night vigil, delay the vigil, so that it is so that it is your last prayer. Of the if you're going to pray the Hajjat Salah, then don't pray with it. Then delay your with it until after the Hajjat Salah. So you wake up at 4 a.m. for example, pray your Hajjat Salah, and then pray your with it. Now, for many people, they fear. They say. If I don't pray with it, I won't be able to sleep properly because my obligation is not fulfilled. That's what helps you wake up for the Hajjud Salah. That feeling of not being... But if you're one of those people who really doesn't care whether he prayed with it or not, then just pray it. You know, some people, they could sleep all night if they didn't pray Isha. It doesn't even bother them. If that's the case, then pray with it before going to sleep. But if you're one of those people that by not praying with it, it's going to bother you, it's going to irk you a little, it's going to keep pushing you, you might wake up a few times during the night, then that's a good thing. Then let your with it be at the end, Pray your tahajjud salah, and then after that you can pray your witr. Some scholars say that you can pray your witr, and after witr, if you pray tahajjud salah after that again, then pray your witr again. You understand? You pray your witr, then if you pray tahajjud salah, then after that you can repeat your witr again. Yes. After this, work on reviewing your knowledge or studying books. Do not spend your time in amusement and entertainment. In, in so doing... In so doing, making them the closing words of your day before you sleep. For actions are according to the last of them. So Imam Ghazali says, this is very beautiful, and we're going to close with this point here. Imam Ghazali says here, that when it comes to the end of your day, don't waste your time. Most people end up wasting time at the end of the day. During the day, they're productive. At the end of the day, they feel like, I'm done, I just want to chill and relax. Imam Ghazali says, no, no, don't chill and relax too much, because if you do that, your Fajr Salah is going to be at risk. You're going to end up sleeping earlier, you're going to sleep late into the day, and that tomorrow's day is going to be wasted. So try to go to sleep early. And if you want to stay awake, use it to use this last part of the day to do good things. Because if you do good things before going to sleep, it's as if your day closed on a good note. And the Prophet says, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالْخَوَاتِينَ What's the hadith? إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالْخَوَاتِينَ Which means actions are based off of their end. If the end of the action is good, Allah will accept the full thing. It's kind of like, I'll explain this to you, to the hadith. You know that one hadith where the Prophet says, مَنْ كَانَ آخِرُ كَلَامِهِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ Whoever states the last thing before he dies, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ What's his reward? Straight to Jannah. If the last thing you say before you pass away, 
Does anyone know anyone that they've met or seen that died with La ilaha illallah? Blessed people, okay? The Prophet saying, if the last thing you say before you pass away is La ilaha illallah, you're going to go to Jannah. Why is that? The reason is because إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالْخَوَاتِيمِ Actions are based off the end. If the end is good, Allah will forgive the beginning, inshaAllah. Allah will forgive any, any weaknesses you had. But to get La ilaha illallah at the end of your life isn't easy. It's something that's very tough. It's something you have to work for. It's not one of those things that you can just do. There's a very famous story they say regarding this hadith. There was a famous uh, muhaddith, scholar of hadith by the name of Muhaddith al-Razi. He was a great scholar of hadith. And he had taught thousands and th- hundreds of thousands had studied by him. He was passing away. And the people of the city had gathered around. He was lying there on his bed. And they, were, they say there were hundreds of thousands of people, like hundreds and thousands, right? thousands and thousands of people there. And there, around him were the biggest scholars of the city while he was passing away. And then there were, you know, as far as you can see, people were sitting there waiting for him to pass away, you know, just being in the company of this pious man with whatever little time they had left. So while they were sitting there, they said, the sunnah is to recite La ilaha illallah around the person who's passing away. say La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah. It gives a person comfort and peace when they're passing away, when they hear the dhikr of Allah, because ala bi dhikrillahi tatma'innul qulub, the dhikr of Allah brings contentment to the heart. They said our shaykh spent his entire life teaching hadith. Maybe while he's passing away, we should read some hadith. So they said, that's a good idea, let's do it. So there were all these guys around him, they were all giants in hadith, and they were all his students. So one of them, he started a hadith. He said, haddathana fulan, meaning I heard this hadith from so and so. He narrowed one part of the chain. The person next to him carried on who, who the next part of the chain was. You understand? The person next to him said, who's the next part of the chain? Who's the next part of the chain? Who's the next part of the chain? So they came across all the way. And finally, when it came to the point where the Prophet ﷺ said, you know, قَالَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ All the students had said the narrator's names. When it came time to say, قَالَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ The shaykh, he sat up and he said, قَالَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ He was passing away. The last thing he said was, قَالَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ مَنْ كَانَ آخِرُ كَلَامِهِ And he, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ And he passed away. He didn't finish the hadith off. What did he say? He said the Prophet, he sat up, the Shaykh Muhaddith Razi sat up and he said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi, and he says, this is the last stretch of his life. Allahu Akbar. Just imagine that, right? He sits up and he says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever's last words are la ilaha illallah, and he passed away. Now everyone's looking at each other, the hadith isn't complete. What happens now? So they said, we heard a voice from the unseen saying, al jannah, he will go to paradise. Right? These were people as well who also existed in this world. Who's, you know, one of my friends, he was showing me a book. And I was reading in the book, it was written by a doctor from Pakistan. He was a, he was an ER doctor or something like this sort in, in, the, in, in Karachi in a hospital. And he was saying that he had been present by the deathbed of most of his patients. And most of his patients that died, he was a Muslim doctor who wrote this. He said that most of his patients that died, the Muslim patients, either they were singing songs, talking about their deaths, or swearing at someone. He said, very few Muslims died with kalima. Because these are our biggest concerns. Would you guys agree with that? You know when you're very into something and you're very nervous, you just start singing songs because that's all you've heard. You know, you've heard songs. So when you're very nervous, you don't even realize you're just thinking of the lyrics. If you're thinking of these lyrics at small difficulties in this world, and when you're driving and nervous, you're just singing a song, what's going to happen when you die? You ever think about this? You know, I remember one of my, I had seen, I was, one brother in the community was passing away. And I, I went to the hospital. And when I went there, they had some music playing in the main hall. And he was in so much pain, he was in so much pain. He sat up and he said, he said to his daughter, he said, go tell them to close the music. I never heard music my entire life. Now you're making me listen to it, I die? So we went to the lady in the reception and said, can you please turn this down? She's like, what do you mean turn it down? I said, the man passing away, his last request before he dies is that he doesn't want to listen to music. And she honored that. May Allah, Allah give her hidayah. She turned it off. She turned it off. So, you know, he's saying that the three things that this doctor is saying that he had seen his patients with, and I'm sure many of you guys are physicians, maybe you have your own stories here, okay? The three things that he commonly saw Muslims dying with in Karachi, you know, it's in a Muslim country. So many Muslims there. What is it he's saying? Either they were, either they were singing, either they were swearing, or they were talking about their financial issues. You know, this money, that money, this money, that money, this money, that money. He said, very few actually died with La ilaha illallah. And how do you die with La ilaha illallah? It's by saying La ilaha illallah throughout your entire day. 
You know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Jaddidu imanakum. Every so often, renew your faith. Every so often, what do you do? You know how like, you go on a holiday, you have to just refresh. The Prophet Sallallahu says, every so often, renew your faith. The, the Sahaba said, O Messenger of Allah, how do we renew our faith? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, بِكَثْرَةِ ذِكْرِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ by abundantly saying La ilaha illallah. Every time you're saying La ilaha illallah, you're renewing your faith. You're renewing your faith. And the Prophet's saying, Jaddidu imanakum. Keep renewing your faith. Keep doing the La ilaha illallah. And if you keep doing that, that's how you're going to pass away. The Prophet says in hadith, Kama tahyawna tamutun wa kama tamutuna The way you live is the way you're going to die. You guys understand the first part of it? What is it? The way you live is the way you're going to die. And the way you will die is the way you will be resurrected on the Day of Judgment. That's why the Prophet ﷺ says that those who die in the battlefield, when they will be resurrected on the Day of Judgment, what will happen? Anyone know? They were, their wounds will still be bleeding. Their wounds will still be bleeding when they stand in front of Allah. And Allah will ask, where is this from? And they will say, oh Allah, this was the last wound I had in the world and this is for your cause. The way you live is the way you're going to die. And the way you'll die is the way you'll be resurrected. So, die, resurrected, let's think about that later. First, what's the first part? The way you live. What are you doing? How are you living? First, think about this. What am I living? The way I live is the way I'll die. كَمَا تَحْيَوْنَ تَمُوتُونَ وَكَمَا تَمُوتُونَ تُحْشِرُونَ So here Imam Ghazali says that you're closing your day off now. And as you're closing your day off, he said, don't end your day with bad things. If the last thing you do every night before you go to sleep is listen to music or watch Netflix or watch some movie, then ask yourself, if you were to die on this night, do you think you even had the chance to do toba before sleeping? Yes or no? You know, I know so many young men, I ask, I, I ask all the time, I ask one, one, a group of young guys, they said, what's the last thing you guys do before you go to sleep? They said, Mufti, you want the real version or the fake version? I said the fake version, obviously. They say, we do a lot of dhikr and read a lot of Qur'an. I said, okay, you guys pushed it a little there. Give me the real version now. This is why she relied on Mufti Sahib. If you want the real version, most of us, the most comforting thing you can do, and he said to me, you should try it as well. The, one, more, the most comforting thing that we can do before going to sleep is smoke a joint. It makes you feel very relaxed, and you can have the best sleep after that. Okay? So there are other ways of getting good sleep too, by the way. In case you didn't know that, in case anyone else is stuck here, there are many ways to get good sleep, other than referring to, resorting to the joint. Okay? But now you're smoking that joint before you go to sleep, the last thing. Let's say that's your thing. Or for example, you're, you're watching something haram, something in a rated X, absolutely inappropriate. Or you're listening to something haram. Do you think you even had the chance to do tawbah before you went to sleep that night? Yes or no? What if you stand up on the Day of Judgment and you're standing in front of Allah with that joint in your hand? No, this is a hadith. I'm not joking here. This is a hadith. The way you die, the way you live is the way you're going to die. And the way you die was the way, is the day you will be? Resurrected. So if you're standing in front of Allah on the day of Jannah with a joint in your hand, it's what is this? Is this how you lived your life? You lived your life like this? So remember, the way you live, and Imam Ghazali is saying, don't let these be the last things you do before you go to sleep. Because if these are the last things you do before you go to sleep, if you die that night, you won't even have the chance to do tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first thing. And the second thing Imam Ghazali is saying here, is that if you go to sleep, and the last thing you do is sins, then we fear that that may be the last thing you do before you go to sleep forever. And he says, no مُخْتُ mawt Because sleep is a sister of death. Sleep and death are the exact same. He says, it's just a sister of it. no مُخْتُ mawt Sleep is a sister of death. He said, if this is how you're sleeping, then I fear one day this is how you're going to end up dying as well. And then Imam Ghazali, the third thing that he says here, very beautiful, he says, فَإِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِخَوَاتِيمِهَا Actions are based off their endings. If you end your day good, evenly, you may have wished to the first part, at least the whole day will be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you end it on the wrong note, then that's the part that we fear the most. So make sure any action of yours, end it on a strong note. You're praying salah, you're not focusing. At least that last 30 seconds of your salah, focus again. You guys understand what I'm saying? You're reading Quran for one hour, you weren't focusing. You're going to close, at least focus for the last three minutes. So the last part you should always be be particular on because the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالْخَوَاتِيمِ Actions are according to the endings. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts from us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us sincerity, and that Allah subhanahu wa gives us all lives of righteousness, and gives us death and righteousness as well. وَصَلَى ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma sifuhun as-salamu ala al-muslim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.